Good morning. My name is Catherine Kane. I work for the WHO Health Workforce Department. I'd like to welcome you to the third episode of the Health Workforce and COVID-19 Action Series. Episode three, together, will bring together panelists who will be sharing their learning and observations throughout the COVID-19 pandemic and during the 2021 International Year of Health and Care Workers. This discussion will be recorded and the recording will be placed very shortly on the Health Workforce website and distributed to all of our participants. Participants are muted during this conversation. Please use the Q&A function to pose questions. Early and often, we love questions. It makes for a vibrant discussion. Uh, and if you have technical difficulties, then please use the chat. But questions, Q&A. Uh, we have a very exciting panel of four guest speakers who are preceded by, even more excitingly, the WHO Deputy Director General, Susanna Jakob. I'll turn it over to Dr. Jakob to begin. Dear colleagues, the interlocking themes of the International Year of Health and Care Workers are Protect, Invest Together. The UN General Assembly just issued a joint statement reinforcing the moral obligation to the health and care workers who have sacrificed their well-being and even their lives so we can continue ours. As we strive to make 2021 a year of transformation, we must listen, evaluate, learn, and turn lessons shared into concrete strategies, actions, and commitments. We must support the health and care workers, who are the foundation of our ambitions to end this pandemic and emerge better prepared for the next, more resilient, and more cohesive. The first two episodes of the Health Workforce and COVID-19 Action Series centered around protection and investment. Our final episode focuses on the links that align and strengthen our promises and actions, togetherness. Multi-sectoral, multi-stakeholder action is at the core of effective policy and management of human resources for health. Whole of society engagement is at the core of emergency preparedness, response and recovery. The health workforce policy and management in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic response interim guidance prompts policymakers and managers to streamline decision-making processes, explore new partnerships to promote public policies and strengthen intersectoral collaboration to mobilize the necessary pandemic response. Multisectoral action spans health, labor, education and finance ministries, and often includes agencies responsible for gender, youth, water and sanitation and social policy. In addition, COVID-19 response coordination often expanded to include defense, foreign affairs, social security, media and telecommunications agencies, across levels of government, national, subnational, local, and types of employers, public, private, not for profit. Today we will hear from professional associations, civil society organizations, governments, and regional alliances about a range of strategies and interventions taken to ensure the readiness education and protection of health and care workers. The actions and strategies include mobilizing health and care workers, 
providing innovative and timely education and training, representing community needs, promoting public health practices, addressing labor rights and decent working conditions, promoting adoption and tailoring of policies and protocols, and much more. Rapid, flexible, and innovative approaches rely not only on leveraging existing mechanisms for political, social, and fiscal dialogue, but also on forging new alliances and improving on existing coordination. The Access to COVID Tools Accelerator Health Systems Connector is one example. Unprecedented investment, research, and development acceleration and innovation in the diagnostic, treatment, and vaccine tools is needed. It must include support for learning, employment, and support for health and care workers, so that they are ready to respond to the pandemic and facilitate the rollout of diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. As we all know, vaccines don't deliver themselves. Within WHO, we have greater alignment and synergy than ever amongst our teams at all levels. We are working more closely than ever with funding, implementing, academic, and civil society partners. We see a great potential in the Access to COVID Tools Accelerator to foster a similar alignment among development partners, but it is especially in countries that we advocate coordinated actions by governments and partners in support of the pandemic response. This whole of society approach is essential to propel us through the COVID-19 response and rebuild and fortify health systems and their human capital, health and care workers against future attacks on our collective health and well-being. Earlier this month, 127 member states adopted a joint statement at the United Nations General Assembly expressing support for the International Year of Health and Care Workers and calling for a global care compact to protect health and care workers. The Global Care Compact will consolidate internationally adopted and recognize principles and recommendations into a single reference document to inform national dialogue, policy, and action for the protection of health and care workers' rights, decent work, and practice environments. Episode 1 brought together global human resources experts to share insights on health and care worker protection through ensuring training and supervision, strengthening infection prevention and control, providing mental health resources, and designing decent work environments. Episode 2 convened UN partners and international financing institutions to urge and support them in designing funding support for sustainable future-looking health workforce investment that has multifold economic, social, equity, jobs, and health returns on investments. In this final episode, which is far from being our final learning opportunity, we appreciate your participation and hope that you will join us in promoting two key objectives of the International Year of Health and Care Workers. Engaging governments and all the relevant stakeholders in dialogue on the Global Care Compact 
and bringing together communities, influencers, political and social support in solidarity, advocacy, and care for health and care workers. We can end this COVID-19 pandemic. We must end this pandemic. We must do this together. Thank you, Dr. Jakob. We are honored to have your presence and your support. I'm now going to introduce you to the first of our panelists. Briefly, I will uh, re-highlight for you that we have five language interpretation today. Please use the buttons at the bottom of your Zoom to change to any of the UN languages. If you are following us on Twitter, please be loud and vocal, and we use the hashtag support healthcare workers. With that, please let me introduce our first speaker. Coming to us from Ireland, Dr. Linda Sisson is the immediate past dean of the Faculty of Occupational Medicine in the Royal College of Physicians, Ireland. In 2016, she was appointed as the National Clinical Lead in Workplace Health and Wellbeing at the Health Services Executive in Ireland. And I'm looking forward to your presentation, Dr. Sisson. Thank you very much, Catherine, and um, a very warm welcome this morning to a very rainy Ireland. And I'm delighted to be part of this experience today. I'm going to talk to you today about the Irish experience as we worked together to protect our healthcare workers during the pandemic. Next. Ireland, as many of you know, is a very small island on the very western edge of Europe. We have approximately six and a half million residents, but of interest, about one and a half million of those live in Northern Ireland, which is a member of the UK. About five million people live in the Republic of Ireland, which is an independent state. So as you can see straight away, we have one island with two very different political systems, two very different health systems, and of course, two different public health systems and jurisdictions. And that had a significant impact on us during the management of the pandemic. The border between the two countries is a very fluid, soft border. And it, for people who are working in the northeast of the country, many people will live in one country and work in another country. Next. So I'm going to talk to you about our experience of coronavirus in our healthcare in the Republic of Ireland. Next. So you can see here a map of two things. One is our experience in the community of coronavirus throughout the year. You, and below that, you will see the mapped experience of healthcare workers um, um, during the pandemic. You can see that Ireland has sustained three main surges. The first two surges, we had um, some testing capacity issues. So the third surge looks like it's bigger than the first and the second, but in actual fact, we were testing more people. The third surge took us completely by surprise. It was over the Christmas period. It is partly due restrictions were lifted, but also it was largely due to the alpha variant, which turned out to be quite transmissible. And I have to say caught us very much by surprise. You can see that the, the shape of the map of healthcare worker infections almost maps directly onto the community experience throughout the surge one, surge two, and surge three. Next. In addition, you can look at the mapping of the healthcare workers. You can see the two main surges there. They are largely happening in our acute hospitals and we're also happening in our residential care facilities. So the two surges were very similar in that regard. And as I say, the vast majority of our healthcare workers who were infected were obviously front, frontline workers, but were working, as I say, in acute hospitals and in our nursing homes and in our other residential care facilities. Next. 
this is a map of our three um, responses to the three surges over the period of 20 and 21. You can see that Ireland went into three lockdowns. Our lockdowns were the most severe and the longest of any country in Europe. Next. This is an interesting map. I know it's quite detailed. I'll talk you through it a little bit. You can see that the various interventions that we, in, that we um, had during the lockdowns and during the phase one, two and three surges um, helped make a difference to the transmission of the virus. So if you, if you have some time to look at this at a later stage, you will be able to see where the lockdown starts, where the advice for mask wearing starts, where we started to introduce um, a gui a guidance and advice about staff movement, social distancing, etc. And we believe that all of those measures together brought the um, individual surges under control. Next. So this is the national framework that was published by the government. I apologize that it's not that clear. However, you can see that the government got together with advice from public health and a number of other specialties. And this was the advice that was issued to the general public. At a healthcare level, next. The first piece that we had to do was issue very clear national guidelines from um, clear leadership with um, occupational health, public health, our infection control colleagues. Uh, like everybody, we had difficulty sourcing PPE in the beginning, but we found that giving very clear guidance together, we were able to advise healthcare workers exactly what to wear in exactly what situation at every phase of the lockdown. Next. The guidelines that we gathered together were very important. And if you look at the different points of um, intervention on our previous slide, you will see that the main levels of guidelines were number one, protecting our vulnerable workers, protecting our pregnant workers and excluding them from high risk workplaces um, for those who had underlying medical conditions. Another guideline that was very important was the necessary derogation of essential frontline workers. We had situations where services were going to collapse because our workers were close contacts and were excluded from the workplace. We had to make a very difficult decision to allow those workers back into the working environment under very strict monitoring guidelines. Other interventions that made a big difference was prompting social distancing amongst healthcare workers. Healthcare workers were meeting in residences and in canteens, and they were taking their masks off and unfortunately infecting the others. The other intervention that made a big difference was providing free isolation facilities for healthcare workers because many of them lived together and they were infecting each other. And finally, it was very important for us to minimize the movement of staff across facilities, particularly um, those working in nursing care facilities, as they tended to be a fluid population and they were moving from one nursing home to another. Next. We set up a helpline for our healthcare workers specifically. We opened this up to all healthcare workers, whether they were working in the public sector or in the private sector. And again, working together, we provided up-to-date public health advice and up-to-date occupational health advice. Over the period of the pandemic, we received over 30,000 calls from healthcare workers asking questions about their own vulnerability and their their queries about contacting the COVID infection and other questions. Next. So you can see that a number of our healthcare workers were infected. 
We, we, our numbers at the moment were over 25,000 healthcare workers were infected in the public and the private sector alone. And it was largely related to these two surges. So we have a number of healthcare workers who are now recovering from COVID. The end of the second surge, I beg your pardon, the end of the third surge was largely as a, as a result of the introduction of a vaccination programme in which we prioritised healthcare workers. We believe that over 90% of our healthcare workers are now fully vaccinated. Next. So you can see that our healthcare workers were battered and bruised and exhausted and um, were complaining of fatigue and infection and post-infection problems. But that wasn't all. Next. On the 14th of May, 2021, we suffered a cyber attack. We are the victim of a cyber attack in all our public health systems in the country. Every single IT system went down. There was no working computers in any of our healthcare facilities, no laboratory reports, no access to radiology, patient appointments, no access to emails, shared documents. We were completely and utterly blindsided. This also affected my PowerPoint presentation as I was unable to download a number of um, a, a number of graphs, etc. So you can see how we were down on our knees and we were then attacked once more. So this has not fully resolved. Final um, slide, please. Next, our status update of July 2021. We are now anticipating a surge of the Delta variant amongst the unvaccinated people of Ireland. These are largely young people. Almost half of our Irish adults are fully vaccinated and we have just set up an access point for younger people to get vaccinated. Um, clearly, we are concerned about the pressure on the health service because of the large numbers of young people who are unvaccinated. As I said, most of our healthcare workers are now fully vaccinated. The cyber attack on the HSE, we still have some significant residual effects around the country, which is including slowing down our ability to provide care in our hospitals and all of our healthcare settings. Since the number, since our vaccination program, the numbers of new infections in healthcare workers have plummeted. Unfortunately, 15 of our healthcare workers have died. Some of those were in the course of their duty. Others had underlying medical conditions and were service users. We are now anticipating a wave of healthcare workers who are diagnosed with post COVID syndrome, and we are expecting between 500 and 600 healthcare workers who are badly affected by the post COVID infection syndrome. So um, uh, our unit is currently putting in, face, in place a number of physical, financial and mental health supports for these workers. And these are being put in place as we speak include access to mental health services, they include access to physiotherapy services and access to occupational therapy services. Um, so that is the status update from Ireland in July 2021. Um, I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you very much for um, inviting me today. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Sisson. I've, I've noticed that you are keeping accurate data on health and care workers who have had infections and deaths and putting in place supports not only in the past but for future anticipated uh, events. And I appreciate the way that your public and private sector are working together to increase public health. You've brought some really important threads into the conversation. I'm going to turn now to the South Pacific Chief Nursing and Midwifery Officers Alliance. We have uh, Mr. Michael LaRui, who is currently the Na National Director for Nursing for the Solomon Islands Nursing Board and Chair of the Alliance, as well as, this is a two for one from the islands, following an island, we have a theme, um, 
as well as uh, Ms. Harriet Sam, who is the Principal Nursing Officer for the Ministry of Health in Vanuatu. Mr. Lauri, Ms. Sam, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Catherine. Warm Pacific greetings to you all. As you've heard, my name is Harriet Sam, Principal Nursing Officer of Vanuatu, and I'm also Chair for the South Pacific um, Chief Nursing Midwifery Officer Alliances, recently appointed in May 2021. My other colleague is Michael Larui, the Director of Nursing in Solomon Islands, who was also Chair for SPC NMOA in 2016 to 2018. And we are thankful for being invited to be part of this webinar. The South Pacific Chief Nursing and Midwifery Alliance was established in 2004 and requested UTS to be collaborating center for nursing and midwifery commencing in 2004. Next. The global map, as you can see, shows where the Pacific is located and how everybody is interested in us. The Pacific has 22,000 islands. I think that should be in the next slide. Eight time zones. It covers one third of the world's oceanic service. Many health indicators still to be met. 74% of health workforce are nurses and midwives from the state of the world's nurses report 2020. Next. 59% health workforce globally are nurses, whereas 73% of health workforce in Western Pacific region are nurses, and 74% are in the Pacific Island countries. 95% are women, 51% are below 35 years of age, meaning we have an increased young population workforce. 27 out of the 37 countries have national nursing leadership, Example, Chief Nursing Officer. Next. To achieve the universal health coverage, all SDGs, we need 4.5 health workers, that is nurses, midwives, and doctors per 1,000 population, which is the WHO recommended benchmark. As you can see from the graph, the Pacific is complex. And let me explain, for instance, in Tokelau, there are only 13 midwives and the population is small. That is why it looks good. However, as you can see, Vanuatu has no nurses. Mostly our main hospitals are covered, but as you travel further out into the remote and very remote areas, we have less nurses practicing in health facilities. I want to add on to that. Our nurses in the rural communities mostly do 24 hour shift work. And often nurses are on their own with only a nurse aide or aide assistant. Recently, in one of my provincial supervisory visits, there was only a registered nurse working in a health facility, and she has not taken her annual leave for seven years. Next. Pacific Islands are impacted by geographical constraints of isolation, disasters, and other factors as seen here. There is a lack of reporting on surveillance data, lack of testing ability, limited ICUs, IPC, HR. And social media is putting out a lot of information about COVID-19 vaccination. And as a result, the public are confused. Next. The Pacific need to strengthen accreditation, regulation, continuous professional development and curriculum across the region to meet health security, UHC SDGs. Few specialist programs and one new master's program for nursing, a lack of continuing professional development in the Pacific, particularly for nurses and midwives, many who have never received any across their career. Next. I will leave this for my colleague, Michael, to continue. Thank you. And Michael, if you're already speaking, just if you could unmute yourself. Thank you. So I will um, 
carry on from where Harriet has left. Uh, so in this uh, year's uh, International Year of Health uh, and Care Workers in episode three with the theme Together, uh, the South Pacific Chief Nursing and Midwife Officers Alliance, um, we have uh, progressed over the years since 2004 when uh, the idea of uh, setting up an alliance was first discussed in our uh, South Pacific uh, Nursing Forum, a forum that is usually organized by an, uh, national nurses associations. And uh, following on from that in 2006, the alliance actually uh, was established uh, in Samoa. And uh, thereafter, uh, we were able to meet at various, level, various uh, levels from the, the global level, uh, also in the, the regional level. And, um, and we, as, as uh, uh, members of uh, ministerial delegations to the World Health Assembly, in our, uh, our participation at uh, the forums such as the International Council of Nurses and the International Confederation of Midwives, uh, chief nurses who attend um, these forums usually uh, have the opportunity to, to meet together and revisit uh, their collaboration uh, in, the, in management of uh, challenges and issues in the Pacific. And so uh, with uh, this uh, current pandemic situation that we are in, uh, the Alliance has, has uh, uh, improved and strengthen their partnerships in uh, in in the sharing of uh, resources, given the challenges that we have uh, in the islands, as uh, as uh, explained by uh, my colleague. Um, in in the principles of partnerships, we I would like to say here that that we have a very strong secretariat. Uh, which is the WHO Collaborating Center from the University of Technology, Sydney. And uh, they have been our, um, our secretariat and, and uh, uh, through their work and through the administrative support, the Alliance has evolved throughout the years, uh, 12 years ago. And uh, next. So uh, as, uh, as a chief nurse who was part of the inception uh, many years back, 12 years back, I can see the, the developments that have taken place uh, both regionally and, uh, and, and our contribution to, to global uh, efforts, uh, including uh, the state of the world a nursing report that was launched uh, last year. And uh, as, as a, a former chair, I have, uh, I have seen and I have witnessed uh, the development and uh, the positive uh, and, and strong partnership that the islands um, had with uh, the many uh, um, uh, island countries. 12 years later, as uh, Harriet has, uh, has spoken earlier, she, she's now our current chair and we are happy. Uh, being appointed recently as the principal nursing officer, uh, the chief nurse for Vanuatu. Uh, Harriet is a person that we can rely on uh, for her leadership in the next uh, two years. Next. So we have, uh, the Alliance has contributed very much to the state of the world's nursing report um, in a meeting that we had in 2019 where we were introduced to the definitions and, um, and contextualizing it to the situation of the Pacific and also introduced to data literacy. And that has, uh, in, our, in our strong partnerships and networks, we were able to successfully contribute to the state of the world's nursing report. Next. So in one of the, the um, the lizard findings in the in the in the Sean report that was launched last year was um, the in the area of leadership, uh, where finding has shown that eighty five percent of participants of the leadership model that that uh, was um, facilitated by the University of Technology Sydney and ran and 
under uh, sponsorship of the Department of Foreign Affairs. Uh, in, from 2009 to 17, we were able to successfully train uh, leaders across the Pacific, where eventually over the years, uh, many of them have held uh, positions of leadership up to chief nurses and, uh, and also like two of our trained uh, fellows are uh, currently health ministers of their countries. Next. So, um, and, uh, and, and also in, um, in, in the, the, the progress that our leaders have uh, achieved through the Alliance, we were able to have given the opportunity to be uh, board members of the WHO Collaborating Center uh, advisory board uh, for the University of Technology Sydney. Next. So the actions during the pandemic. Um, so I am, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really proud to say that that collaboration has even helped us to share our experiences in this, uh, in this uh, pandemic situation. Uh, Today, 11 of our countries have no uh, COVID cases. Chief nurses being part of the executive, uh, exec executive management in the ministries of health have contributed to shutting borders early. Um, one of the challenges with uh, laboratory, uh, <clears throat> uh, laboratory work in the islands where we have to uh, send um, samples and tests to to um, WHO accredited laboratories uh, in, in Australia or in New Caledonia. But in this uh, the situation, we were able to convert gene expert uh, machines for TB for, for uh, COVID testing using uh, cartridges that uh, can be, that are used for uh, testing of uh, COVID. We uh, have PPE uh, delivered to our uh, islands the challenge we have is uh, that uh, most of these are not reaching remote areas. But we also are thankful for our development partners, such as the WHO, uh, which has supported us through the uh, local technical working group on vaccine rollout. We have development partners such as, uh, you know, countries such as Australia, New Zealand, and others who have supported the islands with vaccine supplies, funding and support for operations. Uh, the Pacific Community, which is a regional uh, organization in the Pacific, also uh, supported us with uh, integrated infection prevention and control, which are mostly nurse-led uh, in our countries. Uh, and, and also um, uh, challenges of uh, the ongoing ge geography, uh, HRS challenges, including national disaster. Uh, one of the um, successes that we also have is uh, that uh, the development of adapted basic psychosocial skills training next, which was uh, also uh, developed by the WHO Collaborating Center and uh, uh, which offers free courses uh, focusing on personal well-being, communication in everyday interactions, uh, practical framework to uh, enable first responders to support others, and also recognition of emotional patterns and uh, providing support to individuals. Next. So um, strategically, we have come a long way, but we, we are progressing. And, uh, and uh, currently what we are working on now, uh, as we as we see the ongoing challenges of disaster situations and uh, the current pandemic, we see that the way forward is really to uh, establish a regional quality improvement program. And uh, so discussions have started this year and we hope to continue on up till 2030 where we will be able to uh, look at a sustainable approach in regional accreditation in developing principles of standards and policies, in uh, identifying key ed educational institutes uh, in the Pacific Islands, uh, which will help us to look at uh, how best we improve the quality uh, management systems 
and faculty development regulation accreditation, especially as we uh, are continually being affected by uh, not only the pandemic, but also natural disasters, climate change, uh, which is, uh, has resulted in uh, many of our islands being affected, our atolls affected by sea level, sea, sea level rise and uh, those kind of situations. So, uh, but, and also we are very uh, hopeful and that a lot of uh, regional partners are coming in, giving support to uh, us. And, and we hope that this strategic direction will attract more uh, development partners to help us and to support uh, this effort in going forward into the future. Next. And so uh, this is my last slide. And uh, so for, um, if you wish to know more about the South Pacific Chief Nurses and Midwife Officers Alliance, our secretariat is based at the University of Technology, Sydney, uh, with, under the directorship of Mr. Ramshe. And please visit, uh, you can, if you need more information, you can also visit uh, uh, spcnmoa.com. I thank you so much for uh, this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Leroy. Thank you, Ms. Sam. You've brought together some really fabulous threads with regard to Together's inclusion of health workers within leadership, particularly nurses who comprise uh, more than half of the global health workforce. It's very exciting to see how your leadership is bringing together, especially um, efforts on educational initiatives and following up on the quite important state of the world's nursing uh, report that came out last year and this year's state of the world midwifery report. Uh, I'm sure that your comments, your closing comments on climate change and its interconnection with health will have been music to the ears of our next pre presenter, Dr. Emanuele Capobianco, who is the Director of Health and Care at the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, where he leads the IFRC's global health and care team that provides strategic and operational support to 192 Red Cross, Red Crescent National Societies around the world in the areas of community health, emergency health, and water and sanitation. Dr. Capobianco. Thank you very much, Catherine. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. And a big thanks to WHO for inviting the, the Red Cross to this very important webinar. I'm gonna share my presentation with you in a second. And uh, um, we are not an island, so I'm, I'm calling from Geneva, so I'm sorry to br break the straight that we had until now, but uh, it's a great pleasure to be with all you together. So a couple of words about uh, the, the Red Cross Recrescent um, in the Federation. We are the world largest and oldest humanitarian network that brings together 192 national Red Cross and Crescent societies in uh, as many countries. And our workforce is made of 14 million volunteers and uh, almost 500,000 staff. Uh, so it's a very large uh, workforce uh, uh, established over, over many, many years and, and quite, quite, uh, quite solid. It reaches more than 200 million people every year with um, health services. And we, we really try to be global in terms of our reach, but our basis is really local voluntarism, uh, very much on, on the ground in every corner of, of the planet. And, and our core is really working with communities to empower communities uh, for uh, healthier lives, having them at the centers when it comes to health to improve access to diagnostics, screening, treatment, care and follow up, uh, promoting innovations. And then we do have as a Red Cross, uh, uh, due to our uh, independence, neutral status, uh, an important role for policy and advocacy around a number of, uh, of health matters. If, if we need to put down very to, to a shoestring what the role of our volunteers are, is really around health promotion and disease prevention uh, at the level of, uh, um, of communities, but also responding to emergencies uh, at the individual and, and, and community level, first aid, uh, emergency responses during uh, uh, natural disasters and, and other crises, and of course, 
um, we have been involved in, uh, uh, in epidemics since our creation 100 years ago. The, the Federation was created actually uh, during the Spanish flu. Uh, and, and, and here we are 100 years ago, 100 years later, very much working uh, all over the world around COVID-19, where we have been uh, uh, involved in health interventions and, and also um, uh, social economic interventions benefiting uh, uh, more than 700 million uh, people all over the world uh, uh, over the past uh, um, over the past year, and and the role of the volunteers when we think about the theme that we have the togetherness, it's really to be the link between communities and and primary healthcare. Be it when when we do perform community uh, based based surveillance or being through the referral uh, of uh, um, people who may be identified with acute flaccid paralysis and referring it to to the primary healthcare. Or um, you know, or a, a woman that may need to be referred uh, for um, you know signs of of, of distress uh, uh, um, pre prior to to delivery. So it's really a critical a critical role. And and what I wanted to mention is that this critical role of volunteers uh, uh, is uh, enshrined in uh, a, a legal uh, uh, instruments and resolutions that that. that uh, define since a uh, uh, number of years the, the role of, of national societies Red Cross as auxiliaries to, um, uh, to the government. And so there is a, a, a recognition that is, is more or less strong depending on the different countries for the role that volunteers play uh, within, uh, um, within the government uh, response uh, to, um, uh, to emergencies and the no government's actions around uh, um, health. Uh, and so these, these uh, uh, legal instruments are very important also to strengthen that, that auxiliary role and ensuring that the, uh, the needs and, and rights of, of our volunteers are uh, very much recognized, promoted, respected. Um, and, and just to mention that was on the 12th of December of 2019, that, that was a major resolution passed at this international conference that happens every four years, bringing together member states and all Red Cross Red and societies that really focused on tackling pandemics and epidemics together. Uh, and, and that was just a few days before the announcement of the closure of the Wuhan, uh, Wuhan market. Um, within that, that um, codified role, auxiliary role of governments, our management of volunteers has a three pillars. One is the promotion of volunteerism and, and the recruitment, if you want, of more volunteers within our Red Cross Red Crescent societies. The second one is the protection of volunteers, and I will uh, focus on this in, in my second half of the presentation. And the third is uh, the, the recognition is ensuring that um, the, the, the volunteers are recognized within uh, um, within the, the existing uh, structures of, of, of government response uh, and their work is um, recognized in terms also of, of, of appreciation um, by, by, by various authorities. So I wanted to focus very quickly on three elements of protection. Some of them have already been mentioned by um, the previous speakers uh, talking about nurses, but at the same point about frontline uh, health workers uh, like um, nurses and uh, volunteers is the physical protection. We had enormous problems at the beginning of this pandemic to ensure the physical protection of our volunteers and we lost volunteers in a number of countries uh, that were out there providing critical health and, and, uh, and, and social services uh, uh, but without the, the, the right type of, uh, of protection and we fought um, uh, to, to, to obtain that through governments wherever possible with the recognition of volunteers as frontline healthcare workers, but also as a federation, we were also providing our national societies with protective equipment. That was back uh, at the beginning of, of last year when we had the usual, I mean, scarcity of PPEs. Problem uh, one year later is ensuring that our volunteers are included as priorities in vaccination schemes for uh, COVID-19, which is happening in some countries, but not happening in other countries. And we are very much advocating not to include all, re all Red Cross Red Crescent volunteers in the prim primary group, but uh, certainly those volunteers who are out there providing service and putting themselves at risk because interacting with people to ensuring that physical protection is guaranteed through um, through vaccination. 
The second element is the psychosocial protection of, of our volunteers. Uh, we have, we, our volunteers have engaged in, we've been very engaged in uh, um, psychosocial activities towards our um, clients, our, our beneficiaries. We reach more than 10 million people with uh, uh, psychosocial uh, interventions. And we have trained our volunteers uh, on, on, um, on psychosocial uh, interventions, on first uh, psychosocial first aid, and so on. But a big element of it is uh, protecting um, protecting the helpers uh, and, and 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 protecting uh, uh, psychologically the the those volunteers who are there uh, facing very stressful situations. And that is again part. And I'm bringing you back to to those resolution of international conference. Another one that was passed at the 33rd uh, uh, resolution on 2019 was really about mental health and psychosocial needs. And we had the concept of helping the helpers very much enshrined in this resolution. And so uh, as, a, as an organization, the International Federation of Red Cross has really uh, worked on, on the scaring for volunteers, uh, preparing with, with, with providing tools uh, for uh, psychosocial support. And that element of protecting our volunteers is now part not only of COVID-19, but of any uh, emergency uh, response when we have a, an appeal responding to any natural disasters. That element is now firmly uh, part of, of the response of our, um, of our organization. The third element of protection after the physical protection and the um, psychological and psychosocial protection is the issue of uh, financial protection. And this is very important because um, volunteers uh, may, may get sick, uh, volunteers may die and uh, ensuring that there is uh, there are financial protection schemes uh, for the volunteers and their potential survivors their families uh, is uh, uh, is critical so we have uh, again because of the status of volunteers because they are not necessarily uh, recognized as uh, as as fully as health workers we have very different uh, schemes in in place in some countries we do have uh, uh, public coverage that is offered for our volunteers. This is happening, for instance, in uh, uh, in Colombia, where uh, you know there is a national law for volunteers that that caters for both uh, the the Red Cross volunteers, but also uh, civil defense and uh, um, and fire department, and that provides um, potential benefits like for health, education, and housing. And there is priority access to government subsidized uh, healthcare schemes. In Vietnam, uh, there is a state law that provides um, uh, for Red Cross volunteers to receive funding that is equal to, to health insurance if they don't have one, so that they can move ahead and, and, and get uh, um, health insurance. And if they are injured during, uh, um, during service, they can become eligible for uh, the same benefit that apply uh, to, to, to soldiers, soldiers that are wounded in, uh, in action. So that's an example of, uh, of countries where we do have public coverage for volunteers, but we do have also private insurance in other countries like Uruguay. Um, and, and that is, uh, uh, you know, Red Cross national societies um, uh, developing, uh, uh, covering with, with insurance schemes through, um, through a private insurance. And there are benefits, if you like, from the private insurance to, to, to to work with, with the Red Cross is really a corporate social responsibility. And we can use that as a, a, mutual, uh, um, a mutual entry entry point. Then we'd have uh, from our side, the, the federation that again uh, covers the, the 192 national societies, we do have a global insurance scheme since 2005 uh, that can uh, cover uh, medical costs, uh, disabilities and, and debts. We do have, uh, a rate of 1.5 uh, francs, which is around 1.5 euros dollars per volunteer per year. And we try to uh, um, take this money from, we, we take this money from all the appeals that we raise uh, during, uh, during emergencies. And then we do have uh, um, other um, uh, mechanisms that may be operated by 
uh, national societies, uh, solidarity mechanisms that are established by, by the national society. So not at the global level, but at the national uh, level, like in, uh, uh, in, in Syria, where the Syria Red Crescent add uh, a, a system that, that caters for uh, hospitalization deaths and provides benefits to dependents in in case of of death. And then we have a special fund that has been uh, uh, in place um, from uh, from 1974 that also um, works to to support uh, potential um, to, to protect financially uh, volunteers and and their families in case of uh, uh, accidents or or deaths uh, during uh, um, their duties. And, and just to give you a, a, a brief snapshot of, of a situation right now that was provided by, by, by my colleagues uh, who, who deal with, with, with volunteers management. Uh, we do have uh, 14 in, in, in Asia Pacific, just to be um, close to, to the previous colleagues. We do have insurance schemes, IFRC in 14 national societies. We have 18 national societies that have developed their own insurance schemes uh, in uh, uh, in in country, and then we have five that have uh, solidarity mechanisms, uh, and and uh, and and a couple with uh, um, other type of solidarity mechanisms that are currently being being established. And uh, as you can see, we have activated the, the claims in a number of countries. Number are small, um, but um, you know globally uh, there is. Uh, um, you know, numbers tend to to, to become uh, uh, bigger, and so with this, I would um, I would stop, and I look forward then to have uh, uh, a good exchange in the Q and A uh, session. And I hope I didn't speak too fast for our translators over there. Thank you to them as well. Over to you, uh, Catherine. <laughs> Dr. Capobianco, thank you very much for that. I enjoyed it, particularly that you highlighted the important element of providing a, a financial support to the volunteers in the form of the insurance schemes. We can't afford to lose health and care workers, and we must ensure that we are protecting them in all of the important ways. And it's very good to see how Red Cross and Red Crescent workers are working together to ensure that communities are linked to primary health care. Um, with that, I would like to uh, introduce our final speaker. And uh, just before doing so, I encourage you to share your questions. We've got some absolutely outstanding uh, panelists, and we would like to make sure that we use their time well by, uh, by thought-provoking questions. So our final panelist, Professor Sheila Tlo is co-chair of the Global HIV Prevention Coalition and co-chair of the Nursing Now Global Campaign. She is also the former UNAIDS Regional Director and former Minister of Health of Botswana, where she led a comprehensive HIV AIDS prevention, treatment, care, and support program that's still a model in Africa. We're honored to have you, Professor. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm coming to you from rural Botswana. So I'm hoping that uh, I can be audible. However, as you can see, people can only see my picture because if I put on the, 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 you know, the, the video, chances are it will go down. The, the, the network is not very good. So uh, you will bear with me, but I'm sure I look very pretty, thank you. So let me simply say good morning, good afternoon or give good evening depending on where you are. And I am going to speak very slowly so that, uh, you know, for the translators, because I tried to send some slides uh, and they could not go through. However, at the same time, those slides were a bit of an issue in that I'm presenting an international organization or a global movement, but I'm also going to give examples of the reality in Africa. So as a result, you will bear with me, there will be some controversial and reality testing issues because of our lived experiences here in Africa. I think the very fact right now that everybody over there is able to access internet and even put in slides, and I can't, just because I'm in a rural area, is, you know, is evidence of the inequality that is there that has manifest itself in quite a few pandemics, including the current COVID response. So that I'll talk about the Nursing Now campaign, and I'm really glad that um, 
uh, my colleague from Vanuatu did mention uh, the, the, the statistics there. So I'm not going to go into detail. I'm only going to look at the global nursing now response as a best practice in COVID-19 you know, response for now and for future pandemics. And hoping that right now, as we are saying, International Year of Health and Care Workers, we can be able to take a few leaves from what happened in the Global Nursing Now response and be able to actually implement it so that we are able to ensure that each and every country is involved and we treat this as multi-sectoral as possible because what has happened with the COVID-19 response in a lot of countries has been not multi-sectoral at all, especially when it comes to the task forces. I will be able to, 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 to get into that as an example. So um, we, 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 as co-chair of the Nursing Now Global Campaign, which has come to an end, by the way, but it is continuing under the Nursing Now Challenge. But as I, I, I'm really grateful that I was part and parcel of that. It was launched on the 27th of February, 2018, in collaboration with WHO and with the International Council of Nurses. And it, it's interesting that the board is very multi-sectoral. It's, it's, there are very few nurses in there. In fact, I'm co-chair as a nurse, but my, 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 my co-chair, is Lord Nigel Crisp, who sends his regards, by the way. He is a lord in Britain. So I, I relied on him because you know what? I don't have blue blood. And he, even though he was not a health professional, we were able to really move mountains together. But our board consisted of people in the healthcare field, people uh, in the non-healthcare field. It consisted only also of financiers. Uh, our uh, the, uh, Madam um, Jacob talked about you know resources, and we had financial support from the Bedet Trust for nursing, and so that made us that helped us to move uh, quite a few mountains. But the idea was really to say uh, the, the 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 goal was to improve the global health by raising the status, you know of nursing and midwifery, the status and the profile. And it, it was really to let the world know that we will not be able to meet the challenges of the 21st century, you know, the challenges of health, unless we actually raise the profile and status of nurses, because they are the majority. My colleague has already pointed that out. They are the majority in every country in the, health, in the healthcare field that we will not have universal health coverage without the proper engagement, the proper education, uh, recruitment, uh, deployment, and ensuring that nurses and midwives are in leadership positions where great decisions on health are made. And you know, it's a campaign that is not controversial. I think it came in at the time when every country is realizing just how much they need nurses and midwives because already there is a 5.9 million uh, shortage of nurses and midwives. So the campaign is great. It was run by nurses, but with participation from other healthcare professionals, from ministers, not just ministers of health, because what we said was, you know, it's okay to engage the minister of health, but guess what? In any one country, you have the minister of public service. You have the Minister of Gender. A lot of the nurses are, are females. So that if you are going to meet SDG5 you know, on gender, you better include the Minister of Gender. We also had to engage the Minister of Finance because in any one country, the money comes from finance. So we made sure that the countries really engaged that, but they were run by nurses. And we covered practically the whole world, but also ensuring that we support the nurses as they launched the nursing now campaigns at country level, because we know that, you know what, a prophet sometimes is never welcome in their own home. Sometimes it's a voice from the outside that is saying exactly what you want to say, but it is heard more by the authorities than you. So I traverse my colleagues, 
and I, we traversed the world. We went to the Bahamas. I went to Portugal. I went to, to Sweden, to, 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 um, to a lot of countries. And it was interesting that when I was coming, the minister of health, for example, a lot of the nurses had not even seen their minister. But because I was there, they got to meet with their minister. So, you know, that's why I'm saying sometimes when it's a, if somebody comes coming from outside, strange things happen and they happen for the better. So I was able to meet ministers with the nurses and really articulate what it is that we are trying to say. And most of it was welcome. So that right now, as I'm talking to you, every country has launched nursing now. They were able to do quite a lot. We saw solidarity, a, you know, unity among nurses for a common purpose. For once, we saw global collaboration where nurses were able to say, how far are you with this? Uh, you know, what did you do to influence, move in this direction? For example, education, advanced education for nurses. And somebody like me, I was able to share best practice with other ministers. For example, I was able to say to them, the AIDS response in Botswana, Botswana was almost going to be I mean, demolished by, the, by, by, by HIV. But because I had advanced practice nurses, you know, nurses and midwives and very few medical doctors, I was able to work with these nurses together with civil society, together with community health care workers. And within four years, we brought down the rate of mother to child transmission from 29% to 4%. Now that's a miracle, but it was a miracle that was done by everybody involved, including our traditional leaders. So that that story sold and they were able to then see that we can do a lot. Now, somebody, we talked about the state of the world nursing report. For that one, I want to say that as we advocate for healthcare workers, we need to be able to provide evidence because something about evidence is that it hits you right in the face and you cannot ignore it. So the state of the world report was really just launched by uh, Nessie Now, uh, the World Health Organization and ICN uh, in April uh, you know, 2020. And it was great in that it showed each country where they are in terms of the nursing and midwifery profile. And it was, it's, it's, it was sort of like a, a scorecard where therefore countries feel like, oh my God, I am red. Look at the other countries, they are blue. The Americas are even dark blue. We need to get red, we need to get a feather. So it, it, it really helped. And I'm glad when uh, Linda Sisson presented, she actually presented accurate data. And to just say, you know, as we are doing this campaign for, you know, health and, and, and care workers, let's ensure that we have evidence especially on the impact of COVID-19 on, on healthcare workers, country by country. That's the only way we can be able to reach that. So uh, we did that, but you know, it, 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 it showed also the value of um, uh, research and also really doing the, the planned activities as to say, as a result of that, what do you want to do? Our planned activities for the Nursing Now campaign did not materialize. We had, you know, we, we were able to, 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 to advocate to have, uh, you know, 2020 declared the International Year of the Nest and the Midwife, you know, but the activities did not materialize. However, because that was the advent then of the uh, epidemic, the spotlight was shown on nurses and it was really able to show nurses as this formidable force that can take care of humanity in all cri human crises. For example, in a lot of our own countries, the nurse was the first person that you saw. The person that told you your COVID results, let's say that they are positive. The person that admitted you to a facility if you're showing you know, any symptoms. And as you know, in most instances, no family member was allowed to visit. You know, so the nurse was the last person that you saw before you died or when you recovered. That was the person who was releasing you. So that it showed them just how important nurses are, especially in our countries. Now, I'll tell you the controversial one. My own 
um, disappointment, you know, in the response of countries to COVID-19. That with all that that they had seen in the past year, it was interesting that when WHO was advising that task forces be formed in a lot of countries, and I knew more than 90% of the countries, you know, what was there were technocrats, mostly medical doctors. And you wonder, in a response like this, when we had known, for example, with HIV, that you needed a, as multisectoral as possible, a lot of the, the, the task forces had only medical doctors. Now, since when is a medical doctor really aware of the psychosocial impacts on any one person, especially at community level, of the economic impacts on people, especially at community level? So that I was disappointed that in a lot of our countries, there were no nurses, there were no people living you know, with HIV who know communities and who know how to advocate and who could have been used to carry ARVs and other supplies, especially to people during lockdowns. That was not there. There were no uh, youth involved, yet we know our youth are right there. And indeed, there were no traditional healers, so um, traditional uh, uh, leaders. So you had lockdowns in a lot of countries that did not involve all these, that did not involve the reality of the lived experience at community level. And as a result, you saw people walking around without masks. Sometimes people breaking those very curfews and lockdowns because they did not understand. And that was the situation. And you know, I want to quote a friend of mine who said, for Africa, God is right there. Because between our leaders who are clueless of what is happening and the global community, which doesn't care, we would have perished. So definitely God is still in Africa. And I'm really glad of, of, of that. Because if you look even now, people, you know, I look at uh, on TV and I see people who have been vaccinated. They vaccinated the healthcare workers, the elderly, and they even vaccinated teenagers. We in Africa right now, I have not been vaccinated because there are shortages, you know, the hoarding, the, the apartheid on vaccines, you know, has really shown how, you know, unequal we are in the world. Uh, our healthcare workers, I don't think of any country that has vaccinated all the healthcare workers. Uh, maybe except the Indian Ocean Islands. I'm talking now Africa. I have not been vaccinated. Why? Because I had to give priority to my 95-year-old mother. Otherwise, I would have had to take her vaccine as somebody who they have been to told, well, you are important to the society. Well, you know, I'm, my mother is more important to me. So, but now we are watching TV, we are seeing football games being played with people unmasked, you know, in Europe and all that. And over here, we can't even afford that. So that as for our healthcare workers, you know, that protect, uh, you know, I don't know, you know, where we are. But we are hoping that in this particular instance, we will be able from here on, be able to say, where are we in terms of vaccine access for the developing countries? You know, if we're saying it's time to protect, let's protect. It's time to invest for everybody in the world. And indeed, together, you know, let's be together. Otherwise, the world, you know, some of us in the world will be left behind. So let me simply conclude that to, to say that, uh, you know, the Nation Now campaign showed us united under one common goal, col collaborating with each other, and indeed having leaders mentoring younger leaders for, for, for leadership development. So we want to see that happening from now on in terms of the, uh, the COVID response to really say, let's be together. So I'll end with that. Thank you very much. I will have to say from everybody in the room and from our audience, we hope you will not stop with that. And we know you will not stop with that, traversing the globe, traversing multi-sectoral alliances, and, and traversing different levels of health and care workers. We know you will not stop, um, and we are grateful for that. 
I would like to now turn to question and answer, which is my absolute favorite part of this action series. And I will just ask uh, the, the uh, very esteemed panelists to try to keep your responses brief uh, to two minutes so that we will have time to include more of the great questions that we're receiving. Um, I, I'm going to start with one that I'd like to pose to Dr. Sisson and then to Dr. Capobianco. And that is, what strategies have the panelists used to manage mental health and community connections during COVID-19? Dr. Sisson. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so I'm talking then about the mental health, managing the mental health of our, um, our healthcare workers, um, a very, very important issue, and it's been really critical throughout this pandemic. Um, the first thing I'll say is that we do have a, um, a, an EAP service, a free dial-in EAP service for all of our healthcare workers. But before that, we have encouraged workers to speak amongst themselves. We know that peer support is really important during a pandemic or really important during any traumatic situation. So we did really encourage people to talk with their colleagues, talk with their line managers about the experience that they were having. But we did see an upsurge in the uptake in um, access to our employee services. We've also managed to put in a fast track system for those employees who need to access mental health services for those people who have a mental health diagnosis. So um, they would be the main um, features of our, uh, our mental health outreach. Um, but also, as I say, just some personal messages to people in terms of managing their own personal well-being and uh, maintaining their social and um, their own personal ways of managing um, good mental health. Thank you, and we'll be sure to share any additional resources uh, in our uh, announcement with regard to the recording being posted on the web. If you'd like to share any of the specific resources, part of the goal of this learning series is indeed to promote shared learning and shared, uh, shared information. Dr. Capobianco, would you like to take this question as well? Yeah, uh, to say a couple of things. One, uh, mental health and psychosocial support uh, was not at the forefront until COVID of, of uh, uh, emergency response for, for, for many organizations. And I think the realization of the impact of the disease on mental health well-being has uh, uh, finally uh, bro broken uh, that, that, that uh, glass, glass ceiling. So it's there. Second, um, we, I think this COVID-19 has helped us to normalize the fact that helpers are vulnerable uh, and, and, and that heroes can cry and, and they need support. And, and, and that is something that is uh, um, very, very important in order to have uh, all, all the support that is needed, that realization. And I think from the Red Cross point of view, I mean, we have been uh, uh, now working on this for many years, uh, but at this, the, the, the heightened crisis has, has really, um, you know, clearly shown the, the importance of investing in basic psychosocial skills uh, of, of all our volunteers, starting from your well-being as the, as the number one uh, point and recognizing that no one can take care of, of uh, herself or himself if, uh, cannot take care of others if cannot take care of uh, himself or herself first. And as uh, uh, Linda was mentioning, we had very similar uh, hotlines uh, uh, established. We had peer-to-peer -peer, uh, support uh, um, and also professional help provided uh, uh, as, uh, as needed. But what I, I wanted to remark is the centrality of mental health psychosocial support uh, function for, um, for our uh, volunteers. And as I said, something that we have really ramped up over, over the past uh, uh, few years. So we have seen also the, the YASC uh, really moving into this with specific guides around it. And I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a, a change in the, in the sector that is happening that is uh, extremely welcome. And we are, uh, with the help of, a, of a reference centers for the Red Cross in, in Denmark, really investing heavily on, uh, on this as a top priority for our volunteers. Thank you so much, Dr. Capobianco, and I appreciate that you referenced your reference centers. We, with our collaborating centers, are also looking at the education, training, and support needs 
and, and that is a really important element of ensuring that we protect health workers. Uh, we have a question now that I'd like to throw to Professor Tlo, and that is on the, uh, because you highlighted so clearly the importance of vaccine equity, and we are currently working towards the sprint to September to ensure that uh, health and care workers are prioritized along with high risk groups, and that there is in fact vaccine equity. Um, on the management of, of misinformation on the pandemic and vaccination, it's, it is important to note that health and care workers are an important source of information to their communities and a source of reassurance. How would you address the, um, the management of misinformation? And are there additional points that you'd like to make with regard to equity in vaccination? Okay, uh, thank you very much. Let me, now for this one, I have to speak for Africa and say that, you know what? We grew up with all sorts of vaccinations. And uh, as you are aware, I mean, a child is vaccinated from when they're three months all the way from up to their six years. And some of us even took the small poxes, the whatever, so that information, a lot of the misinformation was coming from outside. Where, for example, in America, when you had President Trump and you know some of the things that were being said, people got that. But fortunately, it was the most educated people and those who can be able to convince and inform them well. But the ordinary person in the village wanted a vaccine like yesterday. They are still waiting for vaccines right now. In fact, as the vaccines come out, the doses, people rush there, you get there and you are told, oh, the last dose was given uh, you know, an hour ago. So the people are still waiting, they, they are flooding the clinics. So that misinformation is a really a question of even countries collaborating and informing each other what's happening in their countries because I'm getting very, uh, like South Africa, for example, there was misinformation at first, but now older people are flooding the clinics. And, and, and guess what? The way, unfortunately, that some of it was also done was, it, it would be said, register online. Now, here I am, I'm in a town, I'm not even in a village, and online is already very not easy to do. Now tell me what older person like my mother is able to register online. So that later we had to bring reality to our leaders to say, look, let the older people just walk in and they will be registered. All they need is an ID card. And in any event, we said, everybody has access, whether you are a citizen or not. So that that's what they're doing. And as a result, people are coming in. So it's not really a lot of misinformation. A lot of it came from the West especially France, during those doctors who were shown on, um, on med social media saying that it should be tested in Africa. Now, once somebody says that, we just think now of the Nuremberg and other trials, you know, the, 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 the US trial, but really it's now that it's happening, people are taking those uh, drugs and people are seeing how after you've taken the, 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 the vaccine, you actually, even if you get infected, you don't become very, very sick. They're going for it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for introducing those important points. And in fact, I was on the line yesterday with uh, a colleague of Dr. Capobianco with regard to this misinformation topic where we're all looking to get the right information into people's hands. I've got a quick question and reminder of the two minute response to uh, Mr. LaRui and Ms. Sam. What has the COVID-19 pandemic made the Alliance do differently with regard to nursing in the Pacific? Okay, so uh, thank you. Uh, maybe I'll go first. And so um, it is in the in the Pacific. It is interesting because, uh, uh, like I said earlier in in my presentation, there are uh, uh, countries that are yet to to record a case, uh, whereas others such as um, Australia, and New Zealand, have already uh, had uh, an, an, uh, quite a number of cases. Uh, Papua New Guinea and um, uh, Fiji now experiencing um, 
uh, surge. Uh, and so it is different across the, uh, the Pacific Islands. But I will speak for um, I will speak for some of the countries that are really yet to um, uh, register, you know, uh, uh, cases um, of that magnitude. That to me, uh, from the experiences I have now, um, the COVID, this COVID uh, pandemic has really, um, uh, it is called on chief nurses of the region to look at, uh, to relook at the strategies and strengthen partnerships. And I think that the second to the last slide that I had with uh, I presented on the strategies, uh, I, I see that no one country in the region, given our scarce resources and uh, our ge geographic um, uh, difficulties, because many, many of the, even, even some of the islands don't have a health center. And so I think for me, strengthening of the alliance is something that we really need to work really hard on. And that is why uh, I ended up with that uh, last, uh, second to the last uh, slide in the regional quality improvement uh, program. We've started over the last 12, as I said, as I said but this, this pandemic really has, has, um, has taught us to really look more strategically into the future as to the partnership that is already currently uh, strong, but issues like um, uh, uh, review of our faculties, uh, benchmarking, between countries, the things that are happening in the bigger countries and smaller countries, how can we um, look at, uh, you know, coming to a point where we we share resources and uh, uh, share resources and uh, 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 making sure that if a country is deficient in that strategy, the other country that is uh, progressing well in that can also come to the rescue. And I think that is uh, what I would like to, uh, my, my response, uh, Kate, thank you so much. And Ms. Sam, if, if you can keep your um, response, if you'd like to add anything brief, please do. Um, yes, I would just like to um, add on to what my uh, colleague Michael has just said that you know, this um, pandemic, COVID-19, has really brought us together, Pacific Island countries, to continue to work, share, collaborate, discuss, and plan well on how we could address the issues together. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for that signal word, together, alliance strengthen, collaborate. Uh, they are, those words are music to our ears. Uh, unfortunately, we have a very short amount of time left and the Deputy Director General was not able to stay. So I'd like to just pose, uh, with, with regard to Mr. Schwartz's comment, I will address that in my closing remarks because it, it is quite important. Um, we have one question that I'd like to pose to Dr. Giorgio Cometto from the Health Workforce. And will this session be tackling coordinated policy response on the international level on the issue of workforce migration and ethical recruitment during the time of a global pandemic? Dr. Cometto. Thank you, Katharina, and uh, thanks uh, to uh, uh, all the participants uh, for their insightful questions uh, and uh, the panelists for uh, sharing their experience. Uh, we did not go into much depth uh, on the issue of uh, international uh, uh, migration. However, we have seen that this has uh, played uh, a significant role uh, also in the response to the pandemic. We've seen uh, countries uh, relaxing uh, their entry standards uh, when this was required uh, or perceived to be required uh, to meet shortfalls. Uh, linked to the uh, uh, requirements, the surge response requirements of the pandemic. And at the same time, we've seen uh, the deployment uh, of uh, uh, international teams of health workers to countries uh, at the times when they were uh, worst affected. So there was indeed uh, a very close uh, interplay between, uh, uh, between these phenomena. Uh, as you know, WHO has uh, a chief normative instrument uh, 
to govern uh, and support uh, uh, an ethical management uh, of international mobility of health personnel, the WHO code. And uh, within uh, that uh, framework, uh, we are uh, uh, now undergoing uh, the fourth round uh, of national reporting. Within that, we have included additional questions that attempt to capture whether uh, the pandemic had an effect uh, on, uh, uh, on uh, mobility practices uh, and uh, any aspects related to it, recruitment, uh, uh, regulation, licensing, etc. So uh, this is an area in which uh, we're uh, looking forward to learning as a result of uh, the pandemic uh, and bringing that uh, even more closely into uh, our policy uh, and technical work uh, in the future. Thank you. On a last note, and uh, I have the distinct privilege to close our session, uh, and this will be the only time I'm acting in the place of our Deputy Director General. Um, thank you for those insights. And I would also like to thank uh, Mr. Thomas Schwartz, Medicus Mundi International, for noting that Dr. Jacob's to-do list makes sense. How do we position together in, in the international HRH policies and instruments? Um, we are, in fact, working right now on a global care compact as part of the International Year of Health and Care Workers. And among the campaign objectives of the International Year, are, of which the theme, you'll all know, is Protect, Invest Together, uh, among the objectives is to engage member states and all of the relevant stakeholders, many of whom are here right now, um, on a care compact to protect health and care workers' rights, decent work, and practice environments. This is work that we will be progressing as the year goes through. Please expect that it will be introduced. We anticipate that it will be introduced at the UN General Assembly and is currently the topic of a very focused review by international HRH experts. We look forward to your contributions to this care compact and to your support and advocacy and political commitment uh, that is represented through our panelists and through our participants today in what is needed to bring together communities, influencers, political and social support in solidarity, advocacy, and support for health and care workers. In conclusion, thank you all for your time. I'd like to thank the IT team, the global interpretation team that has provided us with five languages, the action series team, uh, Ms. Beatrice Wamutitu, Ms. Sharad Agarwal, Dr. Giorgio Cometto, and we're led by, doc, uh, by Mr. Jim Campbell, the Director of Health Workforce, and especially to our Deputy Director General and to our distinguished panelists today, Professor Ch C Sheila Tlo, uh, Ms. Dr. Emanuele Capobianco, Dr. Linda Sisson, Mr. Michael Lowe-Rui, and also Ms. Harriet Sam, as well as our regional and country offices who have supported this initiative. We have such great thanks, and we look forward to moving together to protect and invest in health workers. Thank you for your time. <laughs>